On this cold and rainy and windy night, we welcome you to the 18th Moving Forward Forum, sponsored by New Pioneers for a Sustainable Future. My name is Sister Claire McGowan. I'm director of New Pioneers and one of the Dominican sisters from the community here at St. Catherine. We have an excellent panel tonight, really fine people, to talk about a very important subject, <coughs> farmland for the future, saving agricultural land for the next generation. As I was getting my mind around preparing for this forum last week, I happened upon a Halloween Facebook post from the American Farmland Trust. And the post was a photo of a lot of grotesque looking pumpkins, jack-o'-lanterns. And the caption was, you know what's scary? A future without farmland. So that's what we're here to talk about tonight with some very fine people who have a great deal of expertise and experience with farmland for the future. Our first panelist is Dr. Steve Isaacs of the University of Kentucky College of Agriculture. Steve is a native of our, the great state of Tennessee, our neighbor. He says about himself, born hillbilly and never got over it. Right not. <laughs> and Steve has been teaching at UK for 26 years. Mm -hmm. He teaches farm management and leadership development in the classroom and across the state. Steve has actually worked in 118 of the 120 Kentucky counties. So he knows our state well. Our second panelist is Chris Kubale. Chris, is, Chris is, lives in, on the Boyle County farm, which her grandfather bought, get this, in 1894. She and her husband raised their children on their dairy farm, while Chris had a career off the farm as a psychotherapist in, public pra in private practice. Chris is deeply concerned about our food supply and the future of family farms. And our third panelist is Cody Rakes. Cody is the Director of Farm and Land Development at the Loretto Mother House Farm in Loretto. He and his wife, Angela, along with their delightful eight-month-old daughter, Elizabeth, are young farmers searching for an opportunity to farm their own plot of land sustainably and profitably, which has proven a difficult task, going head-to-head -head at the auction block against developers and other established farmers. So very fine panel, very important topic. We thank you, all three of you, very much for coming. We thank all of you and our audience for coming. And we look forward to a very profitable conversation. So Steve, would you like to start us off? I uh, will indeed. And do I need to use the hand mic or is the bell mic good? Can you all hear me? No, yes. that doesn't do anything. That's for the TV. Oh, that's for the TV. So I do need to use the hand mic. OK. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Sister Claire. and. Uh, uh, for having me here. Uh, uh, this is a topic that has been sort of the focus of my extension program across the state for the last two or three years. And one of the big reasons for that is, as I look around the room and occasionally as I look in the mirror, farmers are getting older. Uh, by the last USDA census, uh, average age principal operators on family farms was 58.3. Uh, that has been increasing about one year per five year census cycle since the 1970s. So we are indeed uh, occupationally one of the older occupations. Bureau of Labor Statistics keeps some numbers and uh, they actually look at median age of farmers a little differently than the USDA does in the census. And they tag the, uh, uh, the farm, average age of farmers at 55.9 and that is the oldest occupational category that they keep data on. Now, would you care to guess the other the next four? What groups are nearly as old as farmers? Presidents. Presidents? <laughs> Not an <laughs> occupational category. <laughs> occupational category of one. <laughs> Not a bad guess. <laughs> Anybody else? A guess. Doctors? Uh, doctors? Nope. 
Turn out a lot of new uh, folks out of medical school. Legislators. Nope. Oh, university professors. I know. Somebody always says that, and I'll be alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, because they are one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Walmart greeters. Walmart greeters, that's probably it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bus drivers. Bus drivers. <laughs> Clergy. Really? Judges. And crossing guards. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that was an occupational category. But yeah, so, so that's why. And, and we've got about 911 million acres of farmland in this country. And USDA did uh, some survey work a few years ago. And over a five-year period, about 10% of that's going to change hands. That's 93 million acres. And three-fourths of that will change hands within families. So age of farmers, the way land is owned, uh, that has there's been a lot of demand for me to come out. I've talked to woodland owners, I've talked to cropland farmers, livestock farmers, uh, done a, a series of meetings across the state, sometimes in, in full day or two day workshop settings and, uh, and had a lot of people come out to those meetings. So it is something that there's a lot of concern about. And, and lots of folks come out and ask, <laughs> you, we try to raise four questions when we get folks to thinking about transitioning a farm from one generation to the next. And and the first one is, do all the generations want that to happen? And I think that's one of the things we're talking about here tonight. And if we transition that, how do we do that? Clearly, one of the transitions, Sister Claire, is to sell out. That is one of the transitions. But <clears throat> culturally, in, in farming and agriculture, we have tended to build a culture where we have this expectation that our kids are going to come back, Chris, and farm. And oftentimes they don't want to. I work with a lady out of Iowa who does a lot of this kind of work, and she talks to young people, and, and as do I, and they'll say, well, I want to go back to the farm. And she says, have they asked you? And that's a good question. We need to know both generations, if we're moving from one generation to the next, need to have some common goals and things that they want to do. Cody, we build an expectation in agriculture that our kids are going to do that. I'll bet you're buying Elizabeth farm toys and farm books. And I did that with my son. I give this advice to my students, and Cody and his wife Angela were students of mine a few years ago. I say, and this is, this is speaking from experience, do not teach your son to say John Deere before he can say Mama. <laughs> <laughs> big, big mistake. <laughs> but what we do, we, we, we sort of build this in. I, I do some of these workshops with an attorney, and he brings a little toy tractor, and he sets it up. He says, how many of you buy your kids tractors or you know toys like this for the farm? You know, it's a farm crowd. Everybody holds their hand up. He says, well, what do you think attorneys do? We buy our kids little bitty uh, yellow legal pads. <laughs> no, we, we start out from a very young age building that expectation. And so that's the first question. Do the kids want to come back? Do the parents want them to come back? Um, the other one, and since I work in ag economics, I work a good bit with this one, is will a transition support the generation that's passing it down? And if they want to come back, and everybody's in agreement if they come back, is there enough income there? So we have to ask those kind of questions. And, and sometimes for folks who've had this land for a good while, they're thinking of that wealth that's been built up in the land as that's going to be their retirement. Well, folks need to do that. Uh, third question, interesting enough, a lot of folks come out and ask, they come to these meetings, on transition succession planning, estate planning, whatever you'd like to call it, they come to these uh, workshops because I don't want to pay any taxes. Well, I'm going to solve that problem for you right now. Unless you are very, very well off, you don't have any inheritance taxes. Under the current federal law, inheritance tax exemption per person is $11.2 million with transferability to the other spouse. So a married couple has an exemption of $22.4 million that's exempt from federal estate taxes. Now, if there's anybody here who has more than an estate worth more than $22.4 million, I'm a little old, but I'm still up for adoption. <laughs> My serious point is, if you have an estate of over $22 million, you could probably afford to get some help to manage those taxes. And if you refuse to do that, by golly, go ahead and pay taxes. Uh, but but so, so that issue, in fact, I, I wrote a little article a few years ago in uh, one of our departmental newsletters that said, Death taxes don't destroy family farms, families do. 
<clears throat> I would challenge you to think of a farm that has ever been destroyed by the taxes. I don't know of one. I've seen some that had to pay taxes back when tax rates were 55% and you had much lower exemptions. I've never seen a farm destroyed by taxes. Everyone in this room has seen a farm destroyed by families. They just couldn't get along. That, in fact, that is probably the biggest threat to family farms is families. And that boils down to communication. So, so those are the kind of questions that we try to get folks to thinking about uh, and, and why they work and why they don't work. Uh, I certainly have a lot of demand for these kind of sessions because of this aging, because we're transferring land. But the, the topic tonight about what do we do when we're looking at transition and if we, and if we don't want to transition that or consider the option of transitioning that down into another generation to another family. And, and this discussion of what we do with the land. And I want to, I want to make this point. And I'll close out with this. I have seen neighbors or family members who have never disagreed on anything in their entire lives, politically, socially, religiously. They root for the same sports teams. They have the same interest. They, they, they've just been lockstep in everything in their entire lives. One wants to sell to a developer. The one wants to keep their farm, and all of a sudden they're bitter enemies. And that happens within families, it happens up and down the roads, and I've seen that happen with, with neighbors. So, so this is serious stuff. 83% uh, of the assets in agriculture are land. It is the overwhelming majority of the assets in land. And how we transfer those effectively to a next generation has been a driver for my extension program. And, and uh, so I'm interested in hearing what Chris and uh, Cody have to say and then we'll have some discussion. So hang on to your questions. We'll get to those later. Chris. Okay. I lived on a farm that my grandfather bought in 1893. And um, I married a man who also, his family had farms. And my grandfather said to my father, uh, you need to keep farming. You need to farm. And so he did, and uh, and then my father said to my brother because, uh, uh, well, he said to my brother, "You need to keep farming." So he did, but I inherited that from the home place, and he had another farm. My husband's uh, father, you know, they said, "Oh, you need to keep farming because." Um, uh, you need to save the farm, and so we had a great A dairy. And my husband and I realized that this model was not sustainable. And so when our children came along, even though they worked on the farm and helped on the farm, we said, you have to get your education. Because we don't think that farming, as we are doing it today, is sustainable. And you've got to make a living elsewhere. Well, we were right, because we were in a grade A dairy, and how many grade A dairies are there left around here? My grandfather started out with mules, and then raised uh, bluegrass seed, and then tobacco, and then cattle, and now uh, we're, we've got sheep on our farm. And so we know lots and lots of yeah, transitions. So anyhow, my two children um, uh, went to school and got educated. And one lives in Cincinnati, and one lives in Washington, D.C., with careers of their own but uh, an incredible love for the farm and came back to the farm. And my husband died 11 years ago. And at that time, it was, he, w he had been ill for quite a while. And frankly, uh, we were not good stewards in that we just had somebody come in and take care of it. And, and we were otherwise occupied and I didn't give it much attention. But then when my husband died and my children um, inherited his half of the land, so they each own a fourth of the land, 
we decided that this was an asset that we owned with no debt on it and uh, we were getting increasingly concerned about food and how farming was done and um, some of the practices that we witnessed in the way people took care of animals, shooting them up with antibiotics and well it, it was it didn't fit our model. So we began talking about what we really valued as far as this this farm we had. Well, to begin, we wanted productive land. We wanted it to be fertile. And we wanted good farming practices on that land. We also raised, wanted to raise good food, whether that was animals or vegetables or whatever. We valued clean air and water and vibrant families and effective partnerships. And so oh, we set out and we sort of camped over at UK and, and got to know the folks over there. We wanted to have collaborative relationships with them and, and community partners. And we wanted uh, to good environmental practices. And so when we got our ducks in a row and sort of figured out what we wanted and we thought, oh, <laughs> where do we go from here? And so the UK people <coughs> were really helpful and, and they asked us to go to, a, we went to a, a, a conference over at K-State and, and we had taken some pictures and of course my children are, are techies, you know, and so we had this wonderful PowerPoint and with all of the family pictures and the farm and everything and so we essentially said we have the land, we have the water, we have the buildings and we have saved so many of the buildings that we are on the National Historic Register for house and farmstead. We have a big mule barn dated 1897 and we have two tobacco barns and a corn crib and a weight house and a shop and two garages and a bed and breakfast and a house. <coughs> so we've got the buildings and so we said we've got the land, we've got the buildings, we've got the water. Now where are you? We need you. <laughs> and so we had a wonderful man come up and uh, we, we were able to have a rather wonderful working relationship, but, but that is, I'm afraid, coming to an end. We were raising sheep, and uh, so we're once again uh, thinking about, you know, what direction that we want to go to. I'm going to live there as long as I live, and so, uh, and, and of course, I can walk, I go out and, and, and look at things and say, that board needs to be fixed, or we've got a leak there. But as far as hands on, it's way past my time. And, and, and this is a real crisis because, you know, you've got your assets all wrapped up in it and we are fortunate in that we don't have to have a whole lot of cash from it. However, you know, you never know what's going to happen. And, um, and so it's a real dilemma. We don't want to, and, and, oh, and another thing, we are right on the Danville city limits, and uh, there, there are subdivisions all around us. We're almost totally surrounded by subdivisions, and uh, I walk down Main Street, and I can just feel their eyes on me, <laughs> <laughs> the realtors, <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, that's, our dilemma is finding people that will uh, use their farming practices in a sustainable manner the way that we the way that we want our land used and uh, uh, the margins are just so slim it's just really difficult and uh, 
my children uh, will never farm, the grandchildren will never farm. They like to come and visit, and they like to see the lambs, and they like to play in the loft, and they like to roam around on the farm, but as far as uh, really getting involved in it, their their interests are elsewhere, and so you know that is that is our that is our situation. That's where we are now, and it's a it's a dilemma. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Um, I'm going to start by telling a little bit of my story. Um, and it's in, in my story is basically, you heard in the intro that my wife and I and our daughter were kind of looking for our own piece of land that we can farm uh, in, in the way that we want to farm. As she, as she said, I'm the farm director for the Lord and Mother House. Uh, so I, I do, farm, I'm a full time farmer, uh, but I farm the way that the sisters of Loretto want me to farm. Uh, so, I, you know, we're looking for a place that, that we can call our own, where we can do things the way that we want to do it. Um, and so, so just a little bit of background about what got me to where I am now. So I began working for my grandfather at the age of 11. Uh, my, my, my mom and dad, neither one were, were farmers, but my grandfather had a farm. Um, and it was the farm that my dad and his brothers had grew up on. Um, but there, it was 72 acres uh, with 30 or so acres of woodland. So it was a small operation that was in no way going to support uh, a, a, even one family's income um, and so my grandfather had an off the farm job but he retired and I was I was 11 when he retired so he once he retired began to farm that much more actively um, and so I, I was at the opportunity at 11 years old I could start helping break hay load hay on the wagons do all those kind of things um, and I quickly realized that farming was my passion and, and I haven't changed my mind on that uh, by, by 14, I was interested in, in owning my own cows and raising my own crop of tobacco, and my, my grandfather helped me in that endeavor. Uh, so at 14, I had an acre of tobacco that was my own. He helped me by financing everything, didn't charge any interest, uh, gave me the land, use of the land for free, let me use his equipment, those sort of things. At the end of the year, I paid him all of the, the cash expenses I paid him back out of my tobacco check. Um, and my first crop, I was a little young and dumb, and I, I spent that money on a, on a four-wheeler. Uh, <laughs> the next year, I was a little bit more of a wise farmer and realized that I should reinvest that, so I actually bought a few cows in my own. Um, and so at, at age 15, I had a tobacco crop, I had cattle, um, and so I was, I was really getting into the whole farming enterprise. Um, a few years later, my grandpa bought 25 heifers uh, to, to stock a farm that he had begun to lease. Uh, and the lease payment was that we cleaned the farm up, fix the fences, bush all the pastures, clean everything up. It had been uh, really just kind of left to its own devices for several years. So we were, our, our lease payment was to, to clean the farm up. And the deal was that I was helping do all of this and, and raising those, getting, calving all 25 heifers out, you know, all those kind of things. And once those heifers were paid for, once they had paid for themselves, I was a half owner in that endeavor. Uh, so I didn't have any cash expense, but I had the labor expense. So I worked all summer for hay, or in hay, and in his tobacco crop, and, and, and all those kind of things. And that was uh, basically for free. He bought my lunches and, and hauled me around. I was 15, uh, so he hauled me around. Uh, but basically, that was, that was towards my share in that operation. And that would probably have been two years of doing that before everything was paid off that I was, then I would be getting some, some, some return out of that. Um, and he also had told me that he wanted the farm that he owned to, to become mine at his death. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a lawyer or an attorney. I, I'm a little unsure of all the legal terms. Uh, but he, he died in 2000, 2008. Um, to the December 2008, so actually in about a month it'll be, it'll be a 10 years since his passing. Well, in January of 2008, so 11 months before he passed, he had drafted a new will that named me as the beneficiary, and then he died in December 2008, so I should have inherited the farm. However, 
due to some technicality of you know signatures not being correct or hadn't been filed correctly or whatever it was uh, that that wheel wasn't valid and so the wheel that was valid dated back to 1990 I was born in 93 so I don't think he had the foresight, the foresight at that point to realize I was going to be the one he wanted to have the farm um, so obviously I didn't didn't get the farm um, I got nothing out of that heifer project. There was nothing on paper. Um, so, so I had worked that entire summer uh, to build a work ethic. <laughs> um, and uh, so I didn't get any of the farm, didn't get any of the heifer project. Uh, I, I did have my tobacco crop. That was all done. Uh, we had sold the tobacco about three weeks before he died. So everything was settled up there. Um, but but I, I'm, I'm saying this to, to express a need for making plans official and and put it on paper and to get a professional involved don't assume don't leave it up to the kids or the survivors um, so my, my grandfather's death and subsequent the, the wheel and probate and all that all that that went on caused family divides that have not healed to this day as dr Isis mentioned that uh, it wasn't the inheritance tax it wasn't the debt on the farm it wasn't the wheel even it was the divides that were caused because of the uncertainty that, that things weren't made clear. Um, to this day, my, my, my dad will hardly not speak to my mother, my grandmother-in-law, uh, or my step-grandmother. Uh, so that, that's, that's an issue. So ultimately, the farm was inherited by my dad and his two brothers, and about three years went by before the farm had to be sold to pay the debt that had been accumulated uh, there was a little bit of debt that was involved in the in the inheritance of the farm, and then the they weren't they weren't good stewards of the money that they had and the and the, and the farm itself. So they had accumulated debt also uh, in the couple of years of operating it. And after three years, they were at a point where it had, had to be sold in order to cover the expenses. Um, so that puts me to now. I'm you know my wife and I were a young couple looking for a, a place that, that that we can call our own, um, and. You know, we're not we're not looking for just any place. We're looking for somewhere that's right for us. Um, auctions are relatively inaccessible to young farmers, beginning farmers. Uh, without, you know, we could go to the farm service agency and get a pretty low interest rate loan, but the farm has to be appraised. It has, to, and we can only get the loan for that certain appraised value. That's tough to do at an auction. Um, Private sale is fairly uncommon unless someone is already farming that operation and whoever owns that piece of ground is interested in selling. Generally, that if they don't have children that are interested, they're probably going to look at the person who is who is tending the land already. Um, so that's that's difficult because we don't. It's difficult to get into that kind of situation. Um, being a young and beginning farmer, we have little to no capital. We have very few liquid assets. Um, and so it's just a tough place to be in order to get a loan to buy these this land, which is very inflated in land price, right? Because the this high land price, which is generally priced based on the development potential, um, it makes it difficult to create payments that are at or above the production value of the land. So then that that puts creates a situation where, as a someone young purchasing a piece of land, I would have to have an off farm job. To, subs to subsidize the income from the farm in order to be able to pay for the operation. So there's, there's some issues there. Um, and with that thought process, I'm a subscriber to the Stockman Grass Farmer, uh, which is a very, very good publication. But there was a, let's see, this is the August 2018 issue. Um, and Joel Salton is, is now the editor of the, of the magazine. He wrote a very good article. So I'm going to read you a few excerpts out of this article. It's called Communal Farm Secession. Within the next 15 years, 50% 50 of all America's agricultural equity <coughs> will change hands. That's never happened in any civilization in peacetime, only in conquest. We live in unprecedented times. Now that I'm beyond age 60 and officially at the age of the average American farmer, I'm having more and more conversations with peers about what comes next. The fact that I took such an early and keen interest in the farm from my dad, loving it as much as he did, and that has now been duplicated in my son Daniel, simply simply makes me weep in gratitude that we have four generation, 
four generations. My mom is a healthy and hearty 94 years young. Living on our farm certainly places us in a special position. Most farmers my age are not in this position. My heart breaks for them. What to do? Of course, some just resign to the situation and either sell the farm or inherit it off to their children, who then have to wrestle with what to do with it. At the same time, I spend a lot of time with millennials, I would be a millennial, who want to be farmers. They're desperate for an opportunity. When my mom and dad bought our farm in 1961, it was $90 an acre, and each acre would grow $90 worth of beef cattle a year. That's a one-to-one -one ratio. Today, it's worth $7,000 an acre and grows $180 worth of beef. He says that's the county average, but they do substantially better than that. That's a ratio of nearly 40 to 1. That's why yesterday's plan won't work today. The business action is what got you here won't get you there. A curious thing about this whole secession issue is that nearly every farmer wants the farm to stay a farm. Even bad farmers don't want to see their property covered in houses or malls or factories. But when it comes time to sell, they want full market price. The success of the transition plan often requires equity concessions. What mom and dad have to realize is that the rise in market value during their lifetime occurred without their input. In other words, nothing mom and dad did had anything to do with the fact that between 1970 and 2018, the market value of the property increased from $1,000 per acre to $6,000 per acre. All those years of hard work had nothing to do with that value increase. It occurred from factors completely outside of their control. <coughs> Furthermore, the increased market value does not bring any more rain, build any more soil, or generate any more hours of sunlight each day. Farmland today is more often than not priced not according to production value, but based on development potential, lifestyle, recreation, or viewscape. Value, therefore, is an arbitrary number determined by sales figures and is completely independent of production. That my mom and dad purchased a property for $50,000 in 1961 that is worth three and a half million today has nothing to do with farming. And they were certainly not looking forward to cashing out with a windfall at some future date. They bought it for the sheer love of farming. I don't know that any farmer who bought land in the 60s and 70s did it to make a windfall on appreciating farmland value. If someone had told them that their land would not appreciate at all, they would have still purchased the land because they appreciate the, the appreciation was irrelevant to the whole scheme. But it did appreciate. That changed a lot of things. Owner's equity, children's inheritance, entry-level capitalization for today's generation. All of this creates a new platform on which to build a farm business. Today's generation cannot duplicate what their grandfathers did. Thank you. Thank you, Cody. Thank you very much. Thank you to each of you. Excellent input. So what we usually do at these forums after hearing um, each of our panelists speak is to invite them to speak among themselves, um, to comment on or question or challenge um, things that they've heard from one another, to, to get into dialogue into more depth about what you've heard from each other. So. Well, Chris, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on you. <laughs> uh, I do a, a lot of work in issues that relate to this. I also work with uh, lenders' conferences and those sorts of things. And, and we have only about halfway tongue-in-cheek described the average American farmland owner as this lady. The little woman who has farmland is getting somebody else to farm it. Now, I work with a colleague out of Virginia Tech, and he, he and I have had this conversation about three weeks ago. He said, you know, we're really going to have to change that definition of this being the average farm owner, because the average farm owner is going to become the 40 and 50 year old couple that live in Birmingham or Washington, D.C. or Atlanta or Houston, and they own the land. You just described your family as being that. You described your kids. They're non-resident. They like that. My question for you is, because for many of those, that average farmland owner who lives in a city somewhere, they have a tendency to view that land as that store of wealth, or if they're leasing it, that income stream. Mm -hmm. You have somehow managed to imbue your kids with some love for that land. I do. How did they do that? <laughs> How did you do that? Well, 
Oh, because I'm just so marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew that. <laughs> Um, I think one of the things, you know, it's all I've ever known. Uh, you know, I'm living in the house that where I played when I was a kid, and there is a, there's an old tree that, that has two little sides to it. It's been so mutilated by age and the wind, and I won't let it go because that was the tree that I remember. When I was riding my pony, that was the tree that had the limb that went out that the pony tried to brush me off by going <laughs> under that low limb and so but anyhow it, it I I think that my I think that my children grew up they grew up on the farm loving it. But we were really clear. My husband and I, we were really clear. We went to a a reading uh, by Wendell Berry at Center College when he wrote one of his books and he was saying that the children are no longer going to be able to stay on the farm because it just wasn't going to be viable anymore for a lot of people. And I was sitting there in the audience in tears because he was talking about me and what we had to say, what we did say to our children was, you really need to get educated and there's just not, uh, there is just not uh, the future here for you. And then I see people like Cody and I think, man, come on, you can do it. <laughs> uh, but. I don't know what the answer is, but I'm just convinced that it can't be what it used to be, but there must be some way out there that people like me and my children now, my, my children in their 60s, who love the land and value the food and value the clean air and value those things, how do we keep that going? And then we do have people like Cody that really have got the bug. They really do want to farm, and they really are interested in it. And so, how can we, how can we adjust this? Uh, how can we, how can we do it? And I don't know what the answer is. I don't, I don't have any idea. I don't know what the answer is. Uh, but I'm willing to stay in and slug it out to see if we can't find some way to uh, but, but you know we don't I don't get any um, you know there isn't any return on it right now and uh, so it's really tough. Cody you got some ideas? Well uh, something that while you were talking and telling your story, and I, thought, I had the same thought at the last event that we were talking at, um, it, that so many that hang on to their farm, hang on to it because they want to continue to have, an, have a bit of an ownership over how the farm is managed. Um, and it, if there was some way that that farm could be transitioned and the former owner or the continuing owner could still have input and have um, some decision power while still by, while being able to transfer the, the management over to the next generation or to the even if it's out of the family that that would be a, a solution that would help a lot of situations because like you said a lot of families the children don't want to come back to the farm um, but there maybe is the neighbor's family that more children want to come back to the farm than can, so they've got to branch out, right? Because that's kind of where yeah. I'm at. I've got to, I've got to find some other family that's going to let me take over their land, um, whether it's at an auction after they've passed and it's an estate sale, or whether it's a private treaty type thing. But but there's so many that hang on to their land because they want to have an they have an interest in how the farm is managed after they have released their ownership or their management. Um, another thing that is interesting is to hear you talk about that you, your brothers and your father 
we're all told, and your husband, we're all told, you need to keep farming to yeah. save the farm. Yeah. And it makes me wonder, how could some farms be managed more efficiently with a younger generation in a managerial role versus the older generation who is getting more tired? And I'm not trying to say anything bad about the elderly folks, but I probably have a little more energy than most of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I could maybe do things a different way that might be more efficient. And so how can how can those generations come together and figure that out and 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 be able to give that younger generation an opportunity to to take that farm over at some point? Yeah, and and and, and I would agree with that. Except I would say that that as I look at some of the farming practices now which feel to me like the way that people raise animals, the way that they raise crops, the bottom line is only the money. We have to get money and it doesn't matter if you abuse the animals and shoot them up with hormones that isn't good for the people that eat that meat or, or if you re raise the, the crops with with only these awful, horrible uh, pesticides and, and killing everything. And so I don't think that some of the farming practices today are sustainable. Yeah. If you're talking about good land. Sure. Um, and so is there any chance, and I don't know how realistic this is, but given what you're both saying, that the farm owner who loves their land and their farm um, might be willing to receive less money in the sale of it because they sell it with some, some attachment to the deed that does limit what the new farmer can do with that land. I mean, usually we think, well, you gotta get the highest price possible no matter what the money, the profit motive. But because there are farm owners who really love their land, do you think it's realistic to think that with the right legal agreements, they might be willing to take less per acre, but know that they're, the next person's gonna treasure the land and care for it to the same degree that they did? And I don't wanna hear Chris and Cody weigh on, weigh on this, but I wanna make an observation here and. Uh, uh, I'm an economist, and uh, people automatically think, oh, that means dollars and cents and those sorts of things. They make a distinction, and this is no insult to accountants. Accountants tend to denominate everything in dollars. As an economist, I would want to say that not everything can or should be measured in dollars. Uh, that there are non-monetary benefits. There are non-monetary rewards. Uh, 26 years ago when I came to Kentucky, uh, I was going to be working for the university, but I wanted some farmland. I wanted to live on a farm. We found something in the south end of Woodford County, and I remember having discussions with some of my accountants and economics friends back in that era that, why did you invest in land? Uh, you know, the stock market was doing much better at that point in time. I said, well, I like to walk on my mutual funds. <laughs> and I wanted to raise a sign in a little community of none such. And I can't denominate that, Sister Claire, in dollars. So what your question re reflects back to that, are you, I wouldn't say taking less, yes, less perhaps in dollars, but maybe you're having more in value. So I, I think that's one of the things that I certainly see in the Cavalli family, is you do not denominate everything in terms of dollars. Absolutely not. Um, and and the, way, the way I have set it up, um, <clears throat> and I'm very clear with my children about this. I'm leaving my half, my half of the farm. They already each own a four. And I'm leaving my half to them, the two of them. I'm not leaving it to grandchildren. I'm not leaving it to, uh, it's those two. Luckily, my children now have been, they've, they've spent their life knowing about the farm and we have had for the last 10 years we've had quarterly meetings where we have we have talked about this odd infinitum i'll tell you and so what we have come up with and i'm i'm clear 
that I don't want to put stipulations on their behavior after I die. I don't want to come from the grave and say, hey, don't do that, <laughs> or hey, do that. I, I don't, I'm not going to do that. And, uh, and, and they don't know what they're going to do. We had a conversation just this past weekend as we were uh, talking to about the barn roof that needs some attention. And, and, and so we were talking about the upkeep and um, they're involved to the point of, of really hands on as far as those kinds of things are concerned. But they don't know what they're going to do. They don't know they've had some health issues. They don't know what's going to happen. And they don't know whether, you know, uh, are they going to need to have a big influx of money because of some sort of physical uh, uh, issue. Uh, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. And so you have to live in that tension of not knowing. But I'm convinced that there must be be a new model that we can design with with older people that have that own the land free and clear and younger people that can can farm it in sustainable manners. Chris, there's a, a program on conservation easements. So you mentioned that you didn't want to come back from the grave and make decisions on how the land was used after your passing. Um, but a concept, would you be willing to make the, de make the decision from the grave that it can't be developed? That sort of decision, as opposed to a decision about, well, you have to be organic or you have to be sheep or you have to be beef cattle or you can't be beef cattle or something like no. that. Nope, I would. No, a decision past, uh, beyond the grave is a decision beyond the grave. And I don't know what's going to happen. And no, I, you know, I can think of ways that, that my children may very well need to <coughs> develop. It. And no, I wouldn't make it. No. Mm -mm. I'm just saying it's not going to be developed as long as I'm living. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> okay, well, our, our format here was to each talk a little bit and then talk among ourselves, but, but I think it's time for you guys to talk to us, mm -hmm. ask questions. You're here because you had an interest, so let's hear the questions, and we may not have an answer, but we'll discuss them. Okay, go ready. Okay, um, I would like to add uh, another part for the discussion, but first I would like just to add some statistics. I, I might not have them quite right, but um, on the line of how farming is not very uh, profitable. Uh, I think in Kentucky we have something like 76,000 farmers and I think 54% of them uh, have less than uh, living wage, that means less than an income of $21,000. Just to say that, yes, we know that farming is not profitable and a lot of those have one or two or three jobs supported mm -hmm. by, by the wife. So, so a, a typical small farm hole has two to three jobs plus their farm typically to make it. That's just to underline how little uh, income there is and to put it in perspective. Then on the other hand, we have about, in the other end, we have about, I think, 6,000 farmers in Kentucky that makes more than 500,000 on income, just to say how divided, how different farming is that way. And of course, those who have that bigger income is a totally different um, type of people. Um, but so I, 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 we, we have farm too, and I stopped doing uh, meat cattle because I wasn't paid for quality. And I, I'm not as timid as some of you guys. I, I think we need to work together to say we, we, we need to be paid for quality. And I think that's something that is wrong here. We, we don't have tradition. I'm from Denmark. We, we are out of cooperatives uh, working together. We, farmers here have not been very good to one another, honestly. 
and not very supportive, and they just are more proud being individualist, they think is better. So they, they could, uh, through the years, like some of in the tobacco industry, they work together, and they, they got better pricing. It was the only thing that was profitable for farmers, that was tobacco. But uh, uh, even, so even you have, you use sustainable methods and uh, have good quality, we are not paid for it, and I think it's wrong. And so how do we, so I would like to add that to the discussion. Uh, you have outlined a dilemma that has been in American agriculture as long as there has been American agriculture. And, and sort of that individualistic market-driven economy has created certain, certain of those inequities that you have described. Um, because we, we have not, I mean, 110 years ago in Western Kentucky, they fought what some of you remember, have read about the Black Patch Wars. It was when tobacco farmers were trying to get together, but yet you had other farmers who wouldn't go along, and it actually no, evolved right. into armed combat. Yeah. Uh, so we have a, a rather sordid history about some of those things. Uh, attempts to do those things at the cooperative level or at the, at the control level of the government have had very sometimes mixed results. The tobacco program came out of government programming that was, I think, a very good program that kept that had really good income distributional effects. It was flawed, so it was actually sort of going to self-destruct on its own because of some things that weren't right about that. Uh, that is, there are no easy solutions to that. And, 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 and please don't kill the messenger here. I'm sort of describing, it's like describing gravity to somebody who's just fallen and broken their leg. Uh, <laughs> markets are not very nice. <laughs> markets have no morals, no scruples, no conscience. And, and one of the sad things, Cody, is, is if, if Joel Salatin was making a lot of money, and let's take the development pressure out of it, if, if there was a lot of profits, Chris, in farming, you know what would happen to land? The market had bid the price up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so land, in, in in essence, is is what we're here for, but it's also part of the problem. So, if I w there is no easy solution to what you've just just described, it's it's there. I, I want to make one other quick point relative to what uh, Cody is talking about: the difficulty of getting started farming, because I think it relates back to this notion of being able to make a living on the farm. Uh, in Cody's lifetime, he's probably never heard anybody say this unless he heard me say it somewhere along the line. Some of you here have enough gray hair to probably have heard someone say, if you can't do anything else, you can farm. Mm -hmm. Anybody hear that? Have you heard it said lately? Mm -hmm. No? Yeah. You've heard it said lately? Oh, yeah. If I got a million dollars, I'm going to farm until it runs out. Yeah. <laughs> Slightly, that, that bugs me. Yeah, it bugs me a joke, but it bugs me. Yeah, it, it does. But I used to think that that saying in and of itself was an expression of ability. If you couldn't do anything else, you could farm. It dawned on me at some point in time that had nothing to do with ability or capacity. It had much more to do with the acceptance of a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. that I can raise a garden, I can put a roof over my head, but I won't have much else. So it was that acceptance mm -hmm. of that lifestyle rather than some mm -hmm. expression of ability. And I think that's why you don't hear people say that except in the context that you just described, that, that we have very few people who are, are willing or, or should be asked to do that. Our parents and grandparents live very poor sometimes. So, so there are some dilemmas here that have no easy answers. You know, or, or part of that. So I'm, I guess, observant enough to realize that yes, farmers are cutthroat, and if you can raise it for a dollar, I can raise it for ninety-eight cents. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's just the way that it is. And the market will pay ninety-eight cents instead of a dollar. Exactly. Um, and so, so that's I realize that, and I guess I'm just observant enough to see it. And so I think that a lot of I guess my peers, those those of us who are younger and are, are trying to make a living at agriculture, we are really looking for premium markets. Mm -hmm. So if the market is not paying for beef cattle done the way I think it should be done, and it can't, the market is not supporting it, the price is not supporting it at the cost 
that it takes to produce it, well, I'm going to find something else to do. I'm going to start doing locally processed beef and selling it out of the freezer, or I'm going to do uh, produce, or I'm going to do something, some other kind of agriculture that's going to pay the bill. Because my generation, we don't like to, what was the quote earlier? Uh, live, live, live poor and die rich. rich. Mm -hmm. We don't want to do that. <laughs> my wife and I are comfortable with a lower income type lifestyle. Uh, but most of my peers want to drive nice vehicles. They want to live live rich and die, die rich. Uh, and so, so most of us, we're going to find something that's going to pay. You mentioned earlier that, that a lot of farming is done based on the, the bottom line, and that's true. Uh, a lot of it is based on the bottom line. Uh, but but I think among the millennial generation, a lot of us are, are probably a little more concerned with the way things are done than the generation before us, which is the generation that's in their 30s and 40s, which are probably the majority of the large active farmers. Uh, but my generation, the millennials that are starting to come into their mid to late 20s, we're more concerned about the way things are done, but we also have to be concerned about the, the income. Other, other questions, comments, observations? I'm yes, curious sir. about the, the extent uh, that corporations are investing in farms in Kentucky. Is there a long-term trend towards consolidation and incorporation of farmland? Or <clears throat> with all this difficulty that we're seeing with transfer of land to the younger generation, the only ones who can make a profit are the ones that have large acreage and the equipment? Well, and certainly in commodity agriculture where economies of scale that have some merit in terms of paying those bills. Uh, consolidation, yes. Uh, corporate investment, not a great deal uh, because let's face it, a lot of venture capital or, or, uh, or corporate money uh, would be attracted to things that have a higher rate of return mm -hmm. because the long run rate of return to assets in agriculture is somewhere in the in the mid single digits, uh, you know, sort of three to five percent, and that's not the kind of rate of return, even in in larger scale agriculture, that's likely to attract a lot of outside investment. So you hear that from time to time, and a few years ago, 20. 10, 11, 12, 13, when land values were, were skyrocketing, there were a lot of outside investors looking at that, but they were looking at it in terms of what the land values were going to do, not necessarily what those returns were. And those were some good return uh, years in agriculture. Uh, but uh, Chris is wanting to chime in here. Let's see what she has to say. We went to a conference, and one of those organizations was there, and my, <laughs> my children took pictures of their, their uh, uh, you know, information and with all their figures on it and everything. <coughs> and so we went home with all those pictures and we were sitting around the supper table and we ran the numbers. And <laughs> we concluded that anybody like, like Cody, anybody that was doing the hands-on, it would take maybe two years, at most four years, before they were completely broke. There was no way that anybody could, could keep paying uh, uh, what, what they demanded to, to keep there. It was, it was, it was awful. It was, and, and, and then the stories began coming out about uh, a lot of the people that came from the Philippines that took part in some of those things, and it was it was obscene what happened to those people. So I think that if you're going to have a if you're going to have a co-op, it ought to come from the bottom. It ought to be people like Cody getting together, and that's that's where it ought to come from rather than top right. down. But maybe that's impossible too. Okay. Yeah. When, you, when you talk about, I want to build on that concept of co-op, because <clears throat> I don't know a lot about farming, but I am curious what Ag Extension and, and other advocacy groups or groups that represent farmers are doing to create cooperatives for younger farmers who are wanting to do just what you're talking about, Chris. Or 
if that's if that's the place for it to be done. I mean, who who can be the leaders in getting those co-ops developed? Even if it's a grassroots effort, it seems like there needs to be somebody kind of taking the leadership on that. Uh, and there are, and and I think in a few years, and when I retire, I want to teach an ag history class. I, I really think the study of agricultural history in this country would be. A fascinating topic to just have some discussions like this in and, and, and certainly the, the cooperative model really looks good it has a lot of merit and it's hard to find very many successful co-ops because you know, one of the things that, that that Cody mentioned you know you got problems like free riders you've got externalities you got folks who want to go around the system because they think they can produce it a little cheaper it's it's it is a wonderful idea that has had great difficulty in becoming established and, and sus the sustainability of co-ops has been very, very difficult. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Apart from, apart from co-ops, is there any kind of organization in Kentucky that's bringing together older farm owners and younger people who want to farm? Is there I know there's a national organization that does that, but is there anything here in Kentucky? Uh, not that I'm aware of in, in that sense, and maybe someone in the audience does. I, I do know, to their credit, uh, several farm credit organizations have uh, what are called young beginning and small farm programs mm -hmm. to offer some better terms. Uh, Cody mentioned FSA, Farm Credit mm -hmm. System has a, a YBS program. Uh, and, and I do know that nationally there are some efforts. I, I jumped down earlier here a minute ago that, that in the transition workshops, I tried to make this point, the fact that three-fourths of all land does transfer to family members doesn't mean that it has to. Mm -hmm. And I think fi farmers finding folks like Cody, their kids don't want to farm, but Cody does. Mm -hmm. uh, I know uh, several years back, uh, Nebraska actually had a state law that if you leased, if you were a landowner and leased to someone with less than 10 years farming experience, there was a waiver on the, the taxes on those, on that rental income. So that was sort of an institutional thing to encourage young farming. So, uh, uh, but, so there are some things out there. Any, anybody else familiar with anything or want to have a? Well, I, I would like to just uh, adjust on, when I was talking about cooperatives, uh, it was really not, a suggestion for farmers to turn into cooperative structure. It was uh, to discuss, as I still believe we need to be paid more. And what I talked about, referred to in, in Denmark or other places, it is that you have the processing plan. Those who are taking care of the sale, we could here be feedlots, the bigger feedlots. It could be the processing, slaughterhouses, processing plants, uh, the, the, the retail sale that is owned partly by, by farmers. That's where uh, the value comes in. So farmers get more in charge. I think we are too kind. I did find a different way to do. I'm not, our farm's not given away. I found another solution, sure. But what I want, would like people, farmers, to think more about is that we have a right to, to look at our farm produce as a business product and not just accept it to be a commodity as so much of it has been, but if you do prime beef or you do specialty chickens or pork, it, it's not a commodity. And, but we have no, no um, control over the prices and that's where I, I think that in order to solve the farm situation, we have to have more control over how we, we are paid, how we sell. And that's another discussion. I, that's, that's what I meant. Uh, no, and I understand that. And, and farmers have long been regarded as price takers rather than price setters. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm about to step in it now. The only thing that, worse, that farmers are worse at than taking prices is setting prices. <laughs> <laughs> because the ones who have some market power tend to do like Cody said, and, and it, it's not based on setting a price that's profitable, but it's setting a price that's cheaper than my competitor. Um. And, and that becomes an issue. So sometimes we would like to be able to set prices, but rarely do farmers have much of a track record at setting them <laughs> at a level that is profitable because we're trying to move the product. So I, I, I didn't mean to be an old grousy cynic in that. <laughs> but I, but, I, but I, I, that, that is a, 
that is a very difficult thing for farmers to, to try to do short of having some sort of supply control system or some sort of price management system. There are some marketing boards on some specialty products that have had some success doing that, but it is not by any means the norm because, like Cody said, somebody if he can pre he'll sell it for a dollar, it's probably somebody who'll sell it for 98 cents. It's one of the dilemmas of the market. Okay. Just to have a couple more minutes, maybe one or two more questions or comments. Yes, sir. I got a comment. Um, I am a landowner, and I hate to see good farmland developed, but I would never impose that responsibility on my children or whoever is going to inherit the land. I am totally against it for ethical and moral reasons, actually. I'm totally against that. It, uh, I don't have the answer. I don't like it either, but I'm not going to put it on my kids. And Sister Claire's comment, uh, young people trans going to own ownership of land, the closest thing that I know would be the Berry Center if you're looking for somebody to take over, the, an older farmer looking for somebody to take over. There's not much out there. It's up to the landowner and the farmer to get out there and do it. They are out there. There's plenty of people out there like Cody that want to farm, but it's up to the landowner to get out there and search them out. But there is a, uh, I guess you would call it an investment group, but I, some of you may be familiar with organic uh, Iroquois Valley. Iroquois Valley is sort of an investment group, and basically their, their model is um, they, they have investors, and they purchase land, um, but they don't purchase that land just willy-nilly. They purchase land that a young farmer is already, or a young farmer or a young farm family is already interested in, okay? So they're basically the, they're the lending agent. Uh, so they purchase the land, the young farmer farms the land and pays a lease payment for a certain number of years at which at the end of that period of time they have the option to then buy that land um, and so there, it is an investment type program uh, but it's not an investment program where they're expecting large dividends it's just a it's, it's a it's a safe place to put money in, a, in, a, in sort of a sense uh, and they are operating in this area, or they're, they're trying to operate in this area. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of them. They typically uh, mandate organic production, but I think they have relaxed that rule a little bit. Uh, but again, their name is Iroquois Valley. Yeah. Iroquois. Say it again. Iroquois. I can't, I'm not sure how to spell it. I -R -I -Q -U -I and that was the one that we took their figures and we figured you'd last. Two to four years. Okay. <laughs> My closing comment was, would be this. I think most of you are here on a stormy, rainy night because you have an interest in the land and, and how that's going to go in the future to perhaps uh, your offspring. Uh, I have uh, worked on several occasions with Chris, and sh she and her family have done something that I encourage other families to do and sometimes they don't do it very well. She mentioned the number of times that they've had meetings and discussions, and you talked about having quarterly meetings. Uh, I have a slide in my presentation when I do the PowerPoint that, that has the, the reason that, that succession planning is not successful, and there's a number of reasons that I put in there, but the one that I have at the bottom, and I have it in bold type, and I have it in red, is failure to communicate. I would encourage you to communicate up and down the generational ladder and make sure everybody understands that. The, the, the line that I use, and I have this on another slide, is almost the worst thing that, that parents or grandparents can say in a conversation is, don't worry, I'll take care of you. That means, don't ask me about that again. Yeah. Yeah. So in her case, her kids do not have to worry about 
being taken care of. They know. They have had discussions. I've been at the table with her kids, and, and they talk, and they talk very candidly. So if I were going to give any one bit of closing advice, it is have open lines of communication and talk about what folks want. Both generations, or three generations, or four generations, talk about it, communicate. I think that's important. So, look. We do have our quarterly meetings, and, uh, and I know that when my son starts the sentence with, now, Mom, <laughs> that's the clue for me to go get my notebook because I have to take some notes because I'm going to get some suggestions about things that I'm to do. <laughs> and so, but, but it is quite wonderful. And, and I have reaped wonderful benefits from this. We, uh, we incorporate the farm. It's an S-Corp. And so we really do legally have to yeah. have to have farm meetings, and we we have minutes and we type them up, and every now and then we'll put a picture or two in there with it. So you've got a real history of what has gone on, but it's been a wonderful, marvelous experience, and brought me very much closer to my children. And uh, uh, although I agree for the condition of, I think, agriculture in general, uh, I have great hopes that, that we, can, we can get this ship turned around somehow or other and, and produce really good food and support the young farmers. We've got to support the young farmers. That's a close remark. We will. Um, Sister Claire, thank you very much for having wait, wait, us. Wait, oh, he I'm said, sorry. He, what he, what's he saying? What are you saying? What? I, I just wanted to hear what you said. We will turn it around. It, it, it will happen. It, it, it's not sustainable the way it is. And the whole system is going to turn over. I think. I'm optimistic about farming. Good. I'm not doom and gloom. There's opportunities out there. Mm -hmm. There are indeed. That's what keeps me yeah. standing in front of classes at the University of Kentucky and having students like Cody and his wife Angela. That, that's what I live for. Thank you for coming out. Sister Claire, thanks for having us. I want to turn it back to you. Uh, but uh, thank you for your presence. Thank you, each one of you. Steve, Chris, Cody, and Mr. On the one hand, I do grieve, and I, I fear that the individualism of the farmer is merely a microcosm of the individual, individualism of our nation. And that if we cannot break through that individualism, there is no hope for the future. But you all are breaking through in each of your different ways. You're doing that breaking through process and you're holding out images of, we don't know how to do it, but we've got to be able to do it. And we will do it, as Arthur says. So it's kind of a, a mixture of a lot of um, different dimensions at this point. But, um, and I also thank each of you for being here tonight on this cold, rainy night. I hope we'll all be safe getting home. And I would ask you to please, we're trying to learn a new skill at New Pioneers that we need to keep data and be able to provide data to funding organizations. So if you wouldn't mind filling out that little tiny piece of paper, you just have to make four circles on it and pass it to the end of your table. We'll pick them up and this is the beginning of a new um, version of New Pioneers Point Two. So thank you again. We, um, we, we know what we're doing is the right thing to be doing, so the fact that we don't know how to do it just motivates us to work harder at it. Thank you and good night. Thank you.